Um, I'm going to put one question out there, first of all, um, that relates to, if I can find it again, that relates to um, differences between um, this work in uh, communities or, or uh, contexts where a lot of people are online and in contexts where there are a lot less people online, so where people don't have access to online information. Um, here we go. So, um, have you seen any differences in the in the misinformation between settings with good access to digital connections versus those who do not? And what's the implication for the infodemiologist? So perhaps first, Joe, um, uh, the work in the US, and as we start to, um, you know, the work that's been uh, going on in West Africa, um, are we seeing any difference in the misinformation that's circulating, let's say, online and offline? Actually, no. I think that's a misconception, um, uh, an understandable one, because uh, there are differences in other uh, kinds of communication environments uh, between um, communities that have uh, broadband access, for, for example, or, or, or heavy social media use uh, compared to communities that, um, that don't. Um, but at least what uh, I'm finding uh, from uh, other organizations in this space and from our own work is that if there is, um, if our systems uh, are picking up misinformation circulating through online uh, networks, those conspiracy theories, those myths, those misunderstandings are also going to be present, for example, in, in rural areas uh, or areas with less internet penetration. An important uh, thing to note, though, would be um, uh, there are indications that there are, you know, homegrown versions of, of misinformation in those communities that wouldn't uh, be, be going up to those larger uh, circulating uh, uh, pieces of misinformation that you would pick up in those systems. So the, the larger the larger stuff is getting into like rural communities and communities that without a, a, a deep internet access. Uh, the, the, the homegrown stuff in, in smaller offline networks isn't necessarily finding its way up into the, into the larger uh, networks, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it, but I do think it highlights the, one of the important principles of the approach that is being taken, which is that um, it's, it, it, you must gather um, as far as possible offline information as well. And, and there's a lot of it out there, you know, um, UNICEF partners like um, IFRC, um, social mobilizers working on polio programs are collecting community feedback um, on a daily basis. And really, you know, it's just a question of being able to, to consolidate that, that feedback as well, those, those insights into the same system, into the same place so that um, that infodemic manager, that infodemiologist has a view of all of, the, of a broader conversation um, within their country, within their communities. Um, I'd like to hand a question off to John, but uh, Sarah, maybe you'd like to chime in too. And it kind of touches upon the idea that um, this stuff can backfire too. So we do have uh, a number of um, studies that suggest that uh, standard vaccine communications, um, when tested, can actually have a backfire effect in particular people who are already have a level of hesitancy or, or concerns about vaccines. Um, and so Kim van Zunen uh, says that they've got a curriculum in the Netherlands already talking about vaccination, so a vaccination related curriculum um, in high school, I think, um, but that they do get some negative reactions from, um, I'm not sure whether it's the kids or their parents who are vaccine hesitants or, or hardcore. So John, have you had any experience yet um, with the game in the in a school uh, context? And do you think there are any kind of adverse events, adverse effects that um, could uh, could come out of the game, and and how how might we mitigate those? It's a good question. It's just over the last few days we have had a an adverse reaction. Uh, just just a one anecdotal example, but it was a case where. Uh, it, was, it was in a school context and some parents didn't like some of the, um, what they claim, what they said were politically charged 
parts of the game. And I've been struggling with this myself because uh, to me, um, I'm feeling a tension between what, what some term as politically charged and I would see as socially relevant, you know, um, and these, uh, it's it's a it's a tricky one. I I, I think that um, uh, we, we're going to have to work through um, the the way that we uh, frame our questions and, and what questions we include in the game. Uh, the power of the logic based critical thinking approach is because it transcends issues. It's possible to inoculate against certain techniques in very innocuous subjects. Um, so it may be that we just strip out the, the parts of the game that appear to be politically charged and, and just use more generic um, topics. You still get the same uh, effects without, without having to worry about those kind of um, adverse reactions. So uh, it's, it's kind of fresh, that your question. We're, we're still struggling with that in real time right now. <laughs> Thanks, John. And so this is, this is, as I mentioned, touching upon the idea that, that vaccine communications can have adverse events. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe, Sarah, we need to be testing them for efficacy, but also for safety, as we do with vaccines. Are you thinking about this? I think it's a great analogy um, to think about it. Um, I think it's been given a lot of thought and consideration in the guide and the way um, the, the Institute has approached these communications because of the past, um, you know, uh, ways that communications around vaccines have backfired, particularly around measles and, um, you know, different um, diseases. So I, I think it's a good consideration that there may be, there should be a, a question around if, you know, um, I mean, if you start seeing intent going the other way uh, after your messages, then that's telling you something. And I mean, the some of this some of this um, uh, research that we have shows that it's it's specifically in people who are already hesitant. You know, on the spectrum that you showed us, is it have, have is it going to be possible to um, when you're testing uh, this content in in certain uh, groups? to be able to understand uh, either the level of, of hesitancy versus you know, general acceptance, or even at an individual level to, to be able to um, kind of pass out the differential impact of, the, of the, the content that people are exposed to based on their pre-existing position. <laughs> I think that's an interesting question. I bet Joe has thoughts on that too. Um, we are not baselining people's hesitancy um, for this, but there are a lot of dashboards that are looking at vaccine that are actually doing that exact thing on a mass scale at the country level. So they're looking at, um, would you get a vaccine if it was offered to you right now and a, a COVID vaccine? And you know the trends of that question is, is really tracking hesitancy um, and acceptance of the rollout. So. Um, I don't think we're baselining individuals on how hesitant they are when they receive the content that uh, they would through the, the platform, but I think it's an interesting uh, question, but we do have some intelligence around um, where the country sits in terms of their hesitancy and where that is benchmarked on a global scale. Mm. And I guess this touches upon the importance of um, countries also doing regular um, you know, surveys that are picking up, you know, in with greater depth and greater um, uh, robustness, that exactly that the level of hesitancy or acceptance in the, in population or potentially in specific communities. Um, exactly. Joe, a question for you. Sorry, go ahead. Go. No, I was just saying that that's a, a very good point that they uh, the countries themselves, especially the country offices, are tracking that, and that is sort of what surfaced. For example, healthcare worker hesitancy in um, in the early uh, rollout in in Pakistan and Ukraine, the healthcare workers were not um, getting the vaccine, uh, so that's what was surfacing that hesitancy. And they could also look at that over time. And maybe a quick plug here: um, 
I'm in the country readiness and demand uh, work stream of the uh, ACT Accelerator, which is the COVAX, the COVAX um, initiative. And uh, there are a number of tools uh, that have been put out in the public domain, including um, <clears throat> uh, model or standardized surveys for both uh, general public and health workers that have come out of the BSD group uh, working at the WHO. Um, so if you are thinking in your country to do uh, more structured surveys like this, there are um, these validated, uh, well, these, these standardized um, survey tools that are available now. Um, Joe, a question for you is, um, uh, what are the most common sources of misinformation? And are there any similarities among these sources in terms of where they get their information? Hmm. Uh, well, if we're talking about um, uh, disinformation, uh, which would be uh, uh, the spreading of misinformation with malicious intent. Um, uh, th those are very easy to identify uh, 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 in, in the sense that if you're looking for um, the, the worst actors, uh, the, they, uh, you know, the, the, there are leaders of the anti-vaccine global movement uh, that, that want you to know who they are and uh, uh, work um, uh, at all hours <laughs> on all continents um, to, to spread uh, uh, disinformation and, um, and engender misinformation. Um, so, and, and they play a really important role here and it's worth mentioning because, because the, they are actively working against immunization programs and, and, and vaccine confidence. Um, uh, and there are great groups like the Center for Countering Digital Hate um, and, uh, and, and other organizations that, that are working very hard to pull back the curtain and expose those individuals and organizations and their, and their motives uh, for doing what they, what they do. Um, then there are um, uh, state-sponsored campaigns which uh, require a, a higher technical proficiency to be able to identify. Um, so there are... Uh, well-documented campaigns going on right now by Russia and China to uh, sow um, a lack of confidence in Western-made uh, vaccines. Um, uh, and um, so, so that's, a that's a different level of, of influence and, and, pro and propaganda. And, and it, in, in some ways, it's much more sophisticated uh, than, than anti-vaxxers. Um, and then if, uh, but I would say most those are important and critical to track and be and understand uh, they, they, because they have uh, extraordinary influence uh, on people, even if people are confident about vaccines. It, over time, what we know from public health research in general and health communications is reach and frequency matters. And if you hit somebody with a message over and over and over and over again, it doesn't matter how confident they were at the beginning, that confidence is going to be eroded. Um, uh, but then a lot of misinformation is just um, uh, just mistakes, just just people looking for information, um, and and that's the majority of it. Um, so while those while the two examples I gave earlier are important, most of this is just we're in the middle of a pandemic, and uh, and nobody really knew anything about vaccines before this pandemic, including a lot of people in public health, uh, and and now we're all interested in it, um, and we're all trying to learn as we go. And it feels like the um, the finish line is is moving, and we're never we're never quite there. And new guidance comes out every week. That's how it feels even to people in public health. Um, and so the scale of it, though, is is what's new. It's it's everybody's confused. Everyone doesn't know where to turn for what's truth right now. Um, and that and that's what I would say is the is the is the biggest thing. So part of this effort that I'm excited about is. Yes, inoculation message theory is critical and, and tracking uh, deliberate sources of misinformation is critical, but also just understanding gaps in the public's understanding is critical. What questions do people have that aren't being answered? How can we answer them better? Um, that, that's, that's just as important. Yeah, and who answers them? I mean, having yeah. worked on vaccination now for 15 years, I've been quite amazed at 
all of these hidden experts that have suddenly emerged in this pandemic, you know, economists and, uh, you know, politicians who all of a sudden are, are global experts on, on vaccines and, and uh, you know, immunology and epidemiology. And <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it's encouraging or not, but um, this does touch upon something that, um, Sarah, you mentioned, uh, which is the importance of the messenger. Um, and so trusted messengers, or uh, I think more importantly, trustworthy messengers. <clears throat> and we know that there is, we, we get our, our truths from the people we deem trustworthy. And so these are people who are credible and, and expert, but most importantly, they're people who are benevolent. They're people who have our best interests in mind. Um, and we heard a little bit about uh, the importance of finding and, and using these people. Um, and Joe, I, I, I want to, no, actually, I'm going to ask you now. And then what I want to come back to is um, the, the inverse, the flip side of this, when the, the, the so-called trusted people are actually saying, um, you know, uh, uh, things that are counter to, to what we would hope they'd say. But first of all, in terms of trusted messengers, um, just to come back to you, Joe, uh, you've already done a lot of talking, but you had a, uh, an initiative in the US where you used, um, you worked through micro influencers in communities. Could you just in a couple of minutes talk about that? Because when we think of trusted messengers, uh, we, you know, we immediately jump to, of course, hopefully health professionals, but also, you know, celebrities, uh, people who are really well known and people who we expect to speak to, you know, the whole population. Could you talk a little bit about the micro influencer initiative? Yeah, um, I think it's new. You know, it's uh, certainly in, in timelines, in public health timelines, it, it feels like it just happened because it's, it's only been happening for 10 years. <laughs> um, but we have, we have influencers um, are, are used in a lot of our work. Uh, and these are average everyday people. These are not health experts um, who have a little bit more influence in their social network than other people. Um, and uh, we uh, reach out to them and recruit them after a vetting process um, based upon who they reach. Uh, so, so we pay attention, we're mostly focused on, we're, we're trying to reach a particular priority population and we find the people who, who reach them effectively and are viewed as authentic and credible. Um, uh, and then we reach out to those people and ask if, they, if they're willing to help. And um, one good thing that's come out of this pandemic is everybody's willing to help. Uh, it, it's actually much easier now uh, to get to get people um, excited about um, spreading a good public health message. Um, uh, so at, I, I would say right now we're probably managing a thousand a thousand people in the U.S. Um, and they're they're talking about all kinds of COVID nineteen related public health protocols, um, uh, uh, vaccine related messaging across a whole num a whole very large number of communities. Um, and it works when, when we do this, these are peer reviewed studies that are published. Uh, we use, um, CDC survey instruments to measure effectiveness when we when we do this and we do it and, and we do it like a public health intervention, not just like a media campaign. Um, we have found that measures of vaccine, uh, hesitancy go down and immunization rates go up. Uh, and so it's about finding a, a critical mass and reaching that reach and frequency number so that you can, you're, you're, you're saturating the, the, the geography you're, you're trying to saturate and the, and the target population you're, you're trying to saturate with, with the message. And I, I, I should mention though, that just as important as uh, influencers are, so, uh, so too are community organizations. Uh, and, and so if you, if you work with both, um, that's, that's like the, the magic, uh, that's where the magic happens. Um, Public health is going to do what public health is doing, and it's important it does it better. Um, but you know, we have a program funded by Rockefeller Foundation right now. It's a hundred community organizations across across uh, priority uh, uh, towns in the United States, and all of those organizations all saying the same thing at the same time, but in the way that they say it to the people who who trust them is a, is really really powerful. Um, and, and probably a lot more powerful than their state health department um, yeah. saying something. Yeah. And that touches upon one of the questions, um, which is the importance of consistency in the messages that people are hearing. And when people hear different things from supposedly trusted sources, it becomes very confusing. 
Then, um, John, we have um, a comment around uh, what do you do if the misinformation is coming from um, high ranking government officials and uh, their lieutenants? Um, the BBC had a, a, a short piece a couple of weeks ago on religious leaders who were um, spreading uh, misinformation. And uh, this is certainly, you know, when the so called trusted uh, messengers are the ones voicing the mis spreading the misinformation. It's it's certainly a, a difficult um, situation to manage. Um, John, you know, your your work shows that when you can highlight the logic or illogic being used by these people peddling the misinformation, or the the tactics that they're being that they're using, that that can help inoculate people. There's also um, it. it is there also a, the potential to inoculate people if you're able to highlight perhaps the motives behind um, their peddling of misinformation as well? So Joe touched upon, you know, some some work that's been done, for example, by CCDH that's that's highlighted that these this this is a big industry and and the some of the people creating this disinformation and spreading this disinformation are making a lot of money out of it, for example. So I guess there's this the the logic based approach. Is there any evidence around perhaps uh, under undermining trust in these in these uh, peddlers of misinformation by focusing on their their hidden motives? Yeah, so I uh, talked about two uh, types of corrections: fact based and logic based. What I didn't touch at all was the third um, approach that you just talked about: source based inoculation or source based corrections, which involves um, explaining how a source of misinformation is not a credible source. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a dearth of research into this approach. Um, in principle, uh, it should work. Um, one limitation of this approach is similar to the fact-based approach in that it only applies to kind of narrow context. Like, you know, you can apply to one source, but it might not generalize in the same way that the logic-based approach works. The one strength of this approach is um, just, again, the human psychology that humans are social animals. Uh, and so social messages often resonate. They're often quite effective. So, um, so in principle, yes. But uh, I'll just say the thing that scientists always say, more study is needed in this area. <laughs> And, and for more study, more funding is needed. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually, um, I'm in the process of studying source-based inoculation right now in a climate context, but comparing it, comparing the logic approach to the source-based approach and just seeing how they might interact. Well, look forward to those results. So we've only got three, four minutes to go. And I'm going to loop back to uh, Suzanne Suggs's uh, comment. Um, so governments don't have time to enroll in courses, uh, to read guides, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to ask each of you, um, uh, starting with Sarah, then John, then Joe, in one minute, <laughs> these government agencies, the public health agencies who are, you know, overwhelmed at the moment, what's your, what's your one piece of advice, your one key learning that maybe they could take and uh, use tomorrow um, to start to manage this challenge. Sarah? I wish I wasn't first. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I think what they should, um, people in government and public health agencies should understand is the great work and the, and the amazing intel they're already in Reseta. So just, I mean, they just have so much um, rich, insights and data and intelligence based on um, their everyday work. So I think just really what we can be most useful is just really harnessing that intelligence into a, you know, a strategy that will resonate. Um, so I feel like just really to, you know, leverage that strength um, on strength and um, really that's just, you know, like gold. Uh, to really have that intel in hand and really just um, how we can be most useful is uh, just hopefully crafting 
uh, quick messages that can leverage that uh, intel they already have and the, and the rich ways they understand how to communicate with their communities. And a good example of that is the US Surgeon General who recently got on, I can't remember where, whether it was TV and, and said, what, <clears throat> what we're learning about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, is clear evidence that the system that we have in place is working. <laughs> it's working. The surveillance that we have in place is working. And that's a message that should, you know, build trust. You know, we have systems in place to even detect these almost vanishingly rare events. Yeah. John, your top tip? Invest in critical thinking in education. Um, addressing misinformation or misconceptions doesn't have to be a necessary evil. It's actually a powerful educational opportunity, not just in terms of improving critical thinking and resilience against misinformation, but um, what education, education researchers call misconception-based learning, teaching science by addressing misconceptions about science is one of the most powerful ways of teaching science. Mm -hmm. My dream, my kind of moonshot goal is if enough investment, if, if inoculation and critical thinking is taught ubiquitously enough in, in education, just pushing that analogy further, like potentially, you know, we can eradicate science denial or at least make it um, um, so, I guess, marginalized that it is societally irrelevant. Thanks. Like we're trying to do with polio. <laughs> exactly. That's the analogy I always use, polio. <laughs> Joe? Um, I would say, so the, the, the other thing the US CDC director said this week uh, was uh, formally declaring that racism was a public health issue. Uh, what governments say matters, even if they don't have the money to put behind the statement when they make the statement. It signals to the public and private sectors to, to act. Uh, and so governments and, and particularly public health need to formally acknowledge that misinformation is a public health issue um, and that it needs to be formally addressed uh, by public health. And, and that has not happened yet. Uh, so that would, get, that would go a really big way, uh, really um, help a lot. Um, and then I think what would come out of that is um, in the study of it and the resourcing of it would come a, a growing understanding, um, and it would be about time, uh, that the uh, messenger matters as much as the message. Uh, that, uh, and that would have a ripple effect, a cascading effect, I believe, uh, uh, um, in a really positive way across both the public and private sectors. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to our three speakers, John Cook, Joe Smyzer, Sarah Christie. Thank you to the Fondation Merieux for hosting this uh, fantastic session today. There'll be another session again to, later on today if, you're, if any of you are still awake and you couldn't get enough of it. Um, but I'd also like to thank everybody uh, who posed questions and all of you who joined us today. Um, please go back, uh, start employing some of these tactics that you've learned and uh, encourage increased funding for this work, please. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>